Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's the podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I am joined with Brandon Camp. You are, um, I believe if I'm reading your profile here correctly or paraphrasing it, uh, you <laughs> describe yourself as an audio engineer. You also do um, electronica music. Uh, Brandon, how are you today? Yeah. Ah, I am splendiferous, my friend. Thank you for asking. Um, in case anybody's wondering, my favorite pasta is fettuccine Alfredo, so I am making it a little bit of that pasta today. <laughs> uh, you're a fettuccine guy. I, I like the sauce, but it, I, I'm not. I'm not big on the fettuccine noodle shape myself. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm an advocate for a tortellini slash ravioli myself. Oh, okay. Well, I do like the cheese stuffed into the noodle, so I, I can go for that. Well, like for Jeez. me, it's like it's like the working man's pasta, you know, because you get like everything in one convenient package. Like you get, you know, your noodle, obviously, and then like the stuffing is like meat or whatever. So it's like just that is true. Very like efficient. Very polite noodle, and you know, it holds it for you. Sort of like waffles. I always thought are like polite pancakes. They just have ridges to hold the syrup for you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You see. You see. You get me. Um, but. <laughs> I guess I guess to get on with the the questioning here. Uh, yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a musician. Uh, take that as you will. I also edit video, uh, audio. Um, yeah. Uh, lately, my focus has been sort of an electronic, but uh, I do make other types of music as well. Right, and um, yeah, I have noticed that like your main focus right now is I, I don't know if it, like the right term is like electronica or if that refers to like a, its own specific branch of like you know its own specific genre or branch of music hmm so um, technically but, I think oh sorry go ahead. every branch of electronica and edm even dubstep like they do have to be within a specific bpm and key so but to be entirely honest that's only for music snobs and i think it sort of adds a level of gatekeeping to the community um, <laughs> so I don't really follow and subscribe to those rules, but, uh, I would say, yeah, it falls into the electronic genre. Um, and I think honestly, with the way that music has been, uh, headed lately, maybe like five, 10 years from now, everybody's going to have a face tattoo and mumble rap and also ride horses. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, fair point. And, um, but I, I guess kind of getting into a bit of your background, if you don't mind, because, uh, sure. you know, I've had, honestly, admittedly, I don't think I've had too many music guests. I think I've had like two others. My very first interview was an underground rapper. I think he was from Canada, if I'm remembering it correctly, like TK, I think. Oh, cool. And then another one was Pick, and he's more um, of like, again, underground, or like, but his is, uh, I don't know what... Uh, I'm not sure what you called like kind of like uh yeah i'm not sure what, what the genre was for him but it's like very his sound was like more experimental you know um okay. kind of like i think with its own like rock inspiration in some ways but um for Got you rock. is this pursued more as like a hobby or did you stu did you study music in, in some way like uh because i know it's like split with musicians <laughs> sometimes like you have uh musical artists that can read music and others that you know um that just don't and they just like you know go about yeah. it as they can so i guess what's your background um so i have played guitar uh since i was around three <laughs> um uh i just i remember even when i was really young some of my earliest memories were being around you know instruments and just not having a full grasp on the world yet so i sort of thought and images and you know feelings and uh, more than you know full memories but just remember seeing guitars and you know like going up to it and just playing with the strings and like trying to strum it while it was on stands and stuff uh but i can read music um treble and bass clef uh don't let my music teachers from forever ago know but i never committed to memory learning bass clef so i just sort of transposed it live in my head from uh treble uh because i also from there uh learned violin and was in orchestra growing up um and you know just generally wanted to pick up more instruments um with life i you know always sort of liked guitar but then at some point i heard you know was 
people some people call it like noodle rock or progressive rock stuff like rush and dream theater and i was like whoa music can be all this complicated crazy stuff uh <laughs> and i started getting really into it um and then in high school i guess around that time uh, I was getting really into, you know, metal and all the emo phase. Got my current hairstyle from there. But uh, I also heard the scary monsters and nice sprites and, you know, some Daft Punk. And that's when I stopped sort of going to lunch um, in high school and started spending my lunches in the practice room on my laptop with an old copy of FL Studio and trying to make electronic music. So that's when I got into sort of the production side of things and did that. Then I went to school um for college i went to msu for media information and i got a degree in fucking keeping it real um I'm kidding <laughs> but uh media and information and you know i ended up uh out of college uh, becoming a studio guitarist for alley records uh which they had a location in ypsilanti and another one in pittsburgh so that's a uh, making a long story longer i guess yeah i have a history in music <laughs> No, yeah, and that's, um, so I, I guess I'm kind of curious then for, uh, let's say we have any aspiring musicians coming up here, like, l reflecting on your time studying, like, music at a more collegiate level, or, you know, and, like, a more, like, I guess, grounded professional setting, would you recommend it for people? I would recommend doing what you like. Um, and... I know that that's a sort of a hard statement to, you know, put into words, because if you enjoy music, um, a lot of the careers that you go into music, unless you get really lucky, you will have to listen to other people's critique. And you just need to let your ego not be a part of it, because, um, you know, if you're a studio guitarist or you're a producer, generally you're making the music for another person and you have to work towards their creative vision. Uh, it, I personally am okay with that, and I think it's sort of fun, and that's how you get more experience in different genres. Um, and I like collaborating, so that's never been an issue for me. But if you, you know, need to be like, if you have control issues or you get don't take critique very well, uh, it's gonna damage your ego. Um, you need to let that go really early on because you know stage fright and a whole bunch of other things are going to you're gonna have to face them in this field of. Like it, it's just a thing that you have to deal with. It sort of comes with the territory. Um, but I, what I really recommend if people want to get into it is, number one, practice with a metronome. Uh, that's a thing that a lot of people overlook. It, I mean, it, you really need to practice with a metronome to ingrain being on time in your head. Because I've heard a lot of people that have you know, lots of creative skill, but they cannot play on beat. And that will set you apart. And I know it's something super simple. But that is a thing that I highly recommend for people. Uh, but beside that, I say do what you like, because if you get put into a niche and you want to do this for a career, you have to realize that it is work. And in order to get to a creative freedom, in order to be able to do what you want, you are going to need to put in the grunt work of getting good. It's not like you're amazing when you start something, you know? So I just recommend if you really want to pursue it, just enjoy doing it and obsess over it. Make it your obsession. <laughs> No, oh, good advice. Good advice. Um, so for yourself, uh, do you th do you think because you said that you had like you started with like acoustic, you know, music outside of like electronica? Uh, do you have an interest in ever like going back to that? Because I know like all of your work right now is mainly like the electronica. I think you're, like your first video was you. I'm assuming like in high school or something playing like a guitar or something. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, do you, do you ever think that you'll go back to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, here, give you a little snidbit here. I always keep an acoustic next to me, so you can hear a little, like, a, I don't know. I Like, I always keep my acoustic on me, so I still play um, quite often. It's just, right now, I think it's been fun to, you know, focus on the production side of things and sort of show off my talents, I guess. It's really fun to make electronic and the whoops. Um, I think the math side of music can be just as, like people are like, oh, it sounds overproduced. Um, and I like to sort of fight that because I think that the production side of things is its own unique type of art. And you can make some really cool sounding things just by experimenting with equalizers and you know effects that way. Uh, that being said, I do have another project, which I guess I can announce here that I'm working on. 
uh, it's a rock album, sort of in the pop punk genre, so that will be pretty fun, you know, with vocals, and it's sort of humorous um, music, but it's, you know, meant to show off rock music, and I get to play guitar and drums and bass and stuff more in there. <laughs> oh, well, looking forward to that. Uh, although I will say I do like a lot of your current work because I think um, if if I'm remembering your channel correctly, you do have like certain hour long like lo-fi. Uh, oh yeah. I, I don't know. Would, would you call it like an album? Like those hour long compilations, like an album in and of itself, or is that just like? Um, a... I call it playing the algorithm because in order to hit YouTube watch time, uh, like for partner, you need four thousand hours of watch time on your channel. And I call having lo-fi mixes that people can put on in the background of doing stuff really intelligent to boost your watch time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But, um, yeah, I guess with that, though, it, with keeping, like, the algorithm in mind, I know a lot of channels go with, like, streaming, like, just, you know, um, constant, like, 24-hour streams of, like, lo-fi music. Have you considered doing that with, like, your own, with your own work? Okay, so I considered doing streams like that, but the problem with doing things like that is it does not boost your engagement. And if you want to get advertisers on your YouTube channel, uh, this is where my media sort of background comes in, um, is they're also going to look for your engagement and click through and also your audience retention rate. And if you have a 24 hour live stream, that's going to sort of crash that side of your, um, you know, engagement level, which could potentially hurt your channel for, you know, getting potential advertisers because if people are only watching i don't know an hour out of 24 hours a day that's not going to look great you know <laughs> right i gotcha yeah that makes sense so so i guess you i would argue then that like you're really tuned in to the whole like youtube algorithm like audience engagement side of things which probably makes sense that's probably why you're at a thousand subs and i'm only at like 13 <laughs> oh. um uh, yeah um I would say that, you know, I've worked on growing other people's things for so long that I finally reached a point in my life where I wanted to pursue and, you know, create and put my own art out into the world, I guess. And honestly, I've been super happy with the amount of feedback I get, because as you saw, oh, pardon me, uh, energy drink coming back up, but, <laughs> uh, but I um, had videos from years ago or whatever but then i didn't do anything with this channel until about two months ago and the fact that well as looking at it right now i almost have 1700 subscribers uh in two months is just baffling and humbling and i really um i'm trying to play into the algorithm but also be creative and be able to have an outlet to put my music out there into the world but i do agree um the lo-fi mixes yeah it's just i have a lot of um projects that i haven't finished before and i was like okay well Here's a lot of little ideas I can put together and to make one long, like, relaxing mix for people. Just put a little drum beat behind it. And also, it's super easy for the video editing aspect because all you need to do is get some stock footage and just loop it, which is great because I don't have to actually put too much editing into the video aspect of it, which is really nice. <laughs> well, congrats on, like, your success so far. Um, although, I, I don't know, like, for me personally, I, I've talked about it a few times on the show, but, like... Uh, I don't know, thinking like of like algorithm, audience engagement, like stuff like that. It, it just seems hellish to me. Like, I, it just seems like such a, not not a bad way to think. Like, I get it. Like, if you want to make money off of YouTube, you kind of have to, right? But it just doesn't seem like an approach I would ever want to like take. That's why I've always kind of jumbled, um, you know, uh, like right now I, I try and build this, like I want to make money off of this podcast but um you know like because you know i need money right but like right. if i ever get like in a comfortable like monetary situation i think i would switch it to like kind of um i've always theorized like a public access type model where i switch it to like creative comments and people can just like use my work for whatever because i know yeah. like recently we had the controversy ongoing controversy with um i don't know if you follow the scene too much but like xqc and like the whole react content um so if i um, if i were on the forefront of like hey my stuff is public access anyways so you could just do whatever with it like yeah you could just react and not say anything like why not i'm not making money off it okay so i know xqc he's a well one of the biggest streamers i would argue um 
Yeah, I think he, I, I know. so did he get in trouble for doing React content? Is that what happened potentially through copyright? I can just sort of put dots together, but I didn't know that he got into there was any legal trouble or things there. Okay, so for you and I guess my my audience too, uh, the big beef with XQC was that you know um, he does like these long streams, and in those streams he does like quote unquote React content where he would just like watch a video and at most he only adds like 40 seconds of like commentary where like the like kind of gentlemanly standard to it is like if you watch something you should add like more substantive commentary right and that's the beef that a lot of people have with xqc is that it's kind of like content stealing because like why would you re-watch the video if essentially you watch it when you know with XQC and there's like a whole bunch of weird things with like VODs and like him posting direct like YouTube videos of his reactions and stuff like that. So that's where kind of mm-hmm. the um, controversy belies. And it's not just XQC, it's like other streamers of a similar like format too. That's an interesting uh, approach to it. I feel like that, well, I guess, I mean, XQC is a brand himself. That's really. Like, I mean, it brings a lot to the table because he's just a likable guy. People want to watch him. I mean, obviously, otherwise he wouldn't be the biggest streamer. But I guess um, I feel like if you're streaming, it's a completely different thing, right? Because you need to do things and constantly be interacting and doing that job is exhausting from what I can imagine. Having to do that constantly, you know, you like you're constantly reacting and putting yourself out there and just being yourself and watching things. You well, know, yeah, yeah, I get that. Hour. Like, you know, if you're a larger streamer, you can't reasonably be like active, like for like I think some of these guys do it for like eight hours. You can't be active the whole time. But I don't know. For me, there's like things you can stream that I think are like more more acceptable to like yeah. like you know just stream without really reacting. Like some people point to like news content is more okay because it's not really like you know, necessarily profit driven or if it is, fuck them. Um, so, yeah, that also leads you to like potentially killing your brand based on what you say if you're doing news and politics. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, um, at XQC's size, like, come on, he could do anything. And like, I, th- I think I like that it's point. Like, so true. It, it doesn't I, really matter. I, like for, for me, what I would do if I was like one of these streamers that stream for like eight hours and i've done it with like some of these podcast videos is um i i put on like a clicker game right or an mm-hmm. idle game that just kind of plays itself so if i need to like whiz real fast i'll just switch to that and you know you can have like a little visual of like you know right. a party traveling through like a dungeon or whatever whatever so oh, i, I that- think there are like better ways to do it certainly than what xqc I can agree, especially since you're um, profiting off of other people's content. And what I was going to say is, uh, like, for streaming, I guess I get it more, but for putting YouTube videos up, that's a little, I'd say, crossing the line, because it's not like somebody has to be there in the moment to watch it. It's like you're pretty much just copy and pasting somebody else's video with your face over it for not doing much. I mean, if you're doing an actual, like, review, uh, I think that it would be more like fair use. But if you're just sort of sitting there with your face, not doing anything, and then say a little tidbit at the end, that's you know more of crossing a line <laughs> yeah yeah that's where kind of um like a lot of the controversy with like xqc came in because i think um i i can't follow the full details but there's like some issues where like he would save the vod so it, it would be like that situation where effectively he was like uploading the reaction it wasn't just like something that you had to see on stream yeah that know? does seem like a bit more of an issue i agree because then why would somebody go watch the original <laughs> um but I guess kind of focusing back to uh, your lo-fi content, which, uh, like, I- I'm a huge fan of, like, I, I'm- I wish, like, um, when I was younger, like, this whole lo-fi movement kind of existed because I've just grown to be, like, such a fan of it, and I find that I like more, like, kind of that calming music, more so yeah. than what I did listen to when I was younger. Um, I was, but- like, a full-on scene kid at... Like when I was younger in high school, I was listening to like Bullet Fry Valentine and you know, <laughs> I was angry at the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I guess what drew you to the lo fi movement then? And was it also just like you enjoying the genre yourself, or was it just um, 
did you find it like easier to produce? Like, what, what was the appeal to you? Well, I really like um, the production side of it because I feel like sometimes simplicity shows more. Like, you don't always need to be show offy in your music. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure you can cut this little bit next segment if you want, but to be honest, the first time I ever heard of lo fi was I was like, like, I've heard the relaxing music for it, but I didn't know what it was, what it was called. Um, I, it was, there was this like quiz on the R34 subreddit and they were like, what is the most up like viewed R34 post? And it was the lo-fi girl. <laughs> oh, jeez. And that's how I found out about well, what lo-fi was. Joke's on you, I don't cut anything for the podcast, so you, oh, that's, that's you're going to totally have to fine. stand by that. <laughs> I mean, I'll stand by it. I think it's hilarious, but um, especially since it's become such a big part of what I make uh, and, you know, vibe checks. And I think it's a good way to just sort of I'm really big into, you know, self-growth and therapy and self-reflection. Um, I think it's a great way to, you know, analyze who you are as a person and understand why you do things for trauma responses and sort of attack it at the roots. So I've sort of taken that aspect of not like, you know, sitting down and meditating every day, but like that aspect of sitting down reflecting catching myself like why do i feel this way why am i thinking that does it come from this you know and having these lo-fi mixes sort of helps put me into that euphoric you know introspective mind state and being able to create music that helps other people feel that way or just relax just is awesome the fact that people like it but that's sort of what drove me to create it but as a view of an artist i think once i put something out into the world it's not really mine anymore you know it's the listeners, whatever they want to do with it. So I, I guess, um, how, how do I want to word this? Uh, I want, I want to like pull back to like, I think when we were like a little while ago, you were talking about like the whole mumble rap scene. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm curious then, are you a fan of that whole, I guess, genre subgenre i don't know it gets muddy after i i know with music genres it gets like muddy uh, you get was, to like the weeds of it yeah for real um i mean i feel like if i look hard enough there's going to be something i like and hate in every genre right um i don't know i'm not really a hateful guy but i mean it wouldn't be my go-to to listen to you know i'd probably change the channel um, but i would say mumble rap's not really my favorite uh but it's just funny because i feel like the style and genre is just becoming so muddled you know, when you see people just like top rock artists and now they used to be mumble rappers like uh, Machine Gun Kelly, for instance, like now he makes pop punk, you know, it's just interesting. <laughs> hmm. No, I, I get you. Yeah, I, I think broadly. And again, this is from my very limited knowledge of like music, but like and I've talked about this concept before, but you kind of get this like bleed over of different genres. Like I know. um a lot of country songs recently have kind of like I implemented like you know hip hop, and there was kind of this like older controversy of like Old Town Road, and oh, like yeah. should it have been nominated for um what's the like the Country Music Award equivalent of like a Grammy? Uh, a bebop. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea either. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like award shows. <laughs> but like, does it does it classify as like a country song? A lot of people were like up in arms because there's like you know a racialized aspect to it and uh, all that. Yeah, that's a bummer that that got brought into it. But <laughs> um, but I guess for so I that guess tough, though, I'm sad. Like I, I'm glad it won awards. I like that song. <laughs> yeah, it's a good song. It's a good song. But for you. Um, do you, I don't know if you hyper fixate necessarily on like, oh, what type of genre of music do I want to approach? Or is it just kind of like more of a relaxed thing for you? Um, as my songwriting process really varies. Um, you know, sometimes it'll just be, I get a line that I think is hilarious. So I try to write a song about it, you know, just that one line. Um, <laughs> or, uh, I just have a melody in my head since I'm constantly humming to myself all day. And then I turn that into a full song just by sitting down and writing it. And then sometimes it comes out in different genres, you know, uh, and sometimes it turns into nothing that happens that that used to happen a lot more, but now I've sort of in, got to this process where I know I won't finish things if i let that happen it'll lead into other aspects of my life so if i sit down to work on a project i'm gonna make it work and then like once i get the confines of a song 
out, even if it doesn't flew, like, flow together, then you can sort of go back and create bridges in between parts. So it is kind of like more of a, like a, a blend for you in a way. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. But, I mean, it really is a blend. Sometimes the inspiration is, like, life experiences, or sometimes it's just an emotion that I want to get out there. Sometimes it's a melody, or sometimes it's a funny line. Like, I had a, I had a song coming up on the Rock album where uh, I came to, like, this line came into my head about, um, <laughs> like, hating when you fall for a siren's call of a mermaid, but the fish half's the wrong half. It's like, the fish half isn't right at all. <laughs> so. Like that became a song called Siren Song. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um and, so yeah, are so just, are you a, are you a vocalist yourself or are you, are you only dabbled in it? Uh no, I I sing. I wouldn't say I'm an expert singer, but I can carry a tune and some people like my voice. So I guess there's that. Uh lately I I mean on the electronic album I featured a couple of my friends on songs. Um, one of them hasn't been released yet, but that will be coming out soon. Uh, Burning Bright. And then I already have music and wubs up on my channel. I'm not sure if you saw that one. Friend singing that. Um, but yeah, I'm a vocalist. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot more of my own voice on the rock style music because I feel like my voice doesn't really work for electronic as well. You know? <laughs> right, I get you. Um... But I guess, uh, yeah, I have noticed you have done some collaborations on your uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I, I can't, I can't remember the name of the one that I'm thinking of right now. But uh, I, I guess for you, I always like to ask my guests this question broadly. Um, mm -hmm. But what's like the big dream collaboration for you? Oh, definitely, I would love to do a song with Ninja Sex Party. That would be awesome. Yeah, that Danny would be Sex the dream collaboration right there. Yeah, I gotta, yeah. gotta do a song with Danny Sex Bang. That would be my dream. Um, God, so man, that's, happen, world. <laughs> yeah, that's not, I, I'm sorry, that's not a name I've heard in like a long, long time, because I used to be like, um, an old school fan of Game Grumps, but, uh, oh, gotta love the Grumps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're still like, I, I think they're still like decent. I know there was like that weird controversy like a while back with like Danny Sex Bang, but I think that's been like, oh no, I miss that. Uh, that always bums me out when I learn that people I really like their creative content turn out to be not great. Hopefully none of it was true, because I really, really enjoy their content. <laughs> yeah, I think it was mostly resolved out. I, I, I can't remember the full details of it, but um, uh, like, I, I kind of fell off with Game Grumps because I know like um, they, they follow like a lot of like YouTube trends. I think one of the trends was like just uploading a lot of like like longer videos i just kind of keep up with it myself yeah i i mean i personally love the gang grumps and i'll still put them on from time to time but i don't have the time to you know watch a 30 to hour minute video of game grumps a day like you know as much as i love them and i think they're funny the i can't i agree that's a big commitment <laughs> So you say so you don't means, uh, you watch every episode of this podcast and watch every song and lo-fi mix that i make so you don't, uh, so I was going to ask, I was going to lead into it, so, but you don't, um, you don't currently follow Game Grumps. Um, I mean, I'll still watch their videos from time to time, but I wouldn't say I watched all of them. Like, I'll try to catch them if I can, because I think it's funny. And sometimes I'll put them on in the background because, you know, their sort of style of Let's Play is more of like a podcast anyway. Right. Yeah, I gotcha. I, I, I definitely, um. I can definitely see that. I, I guess uh, if you can enlighten me as somebody that hasn't watched them, I think for like years now, like what what has been the latest thing for them? Is it just still like random games or? Yeah, I'd say they do. Like from what I've seen, um, the one last one I followed is they played Sonic Frontiers when that came out. And I was like, it took them forever. So like it's sort of random games throughout the week and then weekends. They do like a longer running series if you want to see them complete something big. So. That's sort of their formula now, from my understanding of it. <laughs> ah, I gotcha. Um, well, before we continue, let's take a quick break as we have, you know, our usual sponsor, Salty Llama. Uh, Brandon. Yeah. Have you ever had any issues with your laundry? Oh, yeah. That's really funny that you sent that, because my upcoming rock band name is Laundry Day. Well, speaking of laundry day, are you tired of lugging around heavy bottles of detergent dealing with the mess of measuring the right amount? Introducing Salty Llama, the ultra-concentrated, hypoallergenic, and toxins-free laundry detergent strips that are revolutionizing the industry. 
Their eco-friendly strips are easy to use. Just toss one in with your laundry and you're good to go. With Salty Laundry, you can say goodbye to harsh chemicals and hello to a cleaner, greener laundry experience. But it's not just good for the environment, it's good for you and your family. Their hyperallergenic formula is gentle on sensitive skin, making it perfect for babies, kids, and adults with allergies. Don't just take my word for it. Give Salty Lama a try and see the difference for yourself. You'll be amazed at how powerful and effective the detergent strips are. Visit www.saltylama.com and order yours today. And don't forget to use the code podcast pasta at checkout for a special discount. Again, that's www.saltylama.com. The code is podcast pasta. I have it in my notes, says all caps. But as always, I don't know. I never checked the code. Um, but yeah, back to the interview at hand. Um, so I guess, uh, like I, I, uh, I hate asking this question because, um, I know like it's such a, because I get it. Like you, your main focus is like music. Um, and it's like asking like a cook, Hey, do you want to farm? But have you ever thought of branching out beyond like, you know, music? Oh yeah, of course. Um, I'd love to do other things. Uh, I really enjoy voice acting, um, so I think it would be fun to do other forms of content that are engaging to people as well, you know? Um, anything that can sort of bring positivity in the world, or at least bring interesting topics. Like, I find it fascinating, some of the Reddit stories of, you know, like, uh, AITA or am I the asshole or just you know maybe sitting down with some friends and getting their view on that or just reading the can't sleep um like uh creepy stories and put writing some original music uh and background to that or perhaps you know just all around voice acting uh I would really like to um you know branch out do a little bit more things I I've always been really into video games so any in that I could get to do something in that sort of field would be wonderful. Too bad I missed that huge Among Us phase. That would have been great. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Um, but with the whole like voice acting field, like obviously you're having we're having like a lot of shakeups uh, nowadays with like the whole AI generative AI for like you know potentially replacing like voice actors and you know the whole Hollywood strikes and everything. By the way, if you're listening, support those strikes for the love of God. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, does that does that create kind of any deterrence for you personally? Uh, not particularly. Um, I mean, I think that AIs are a great tool, and I find them fascinating. Every one that I've seen, I like messing around with. Um, to be honest, it's really fun, and they're going to take us over eventually anyway. But I think humanity as a whole will try to support other humans. Uh, and we're not quite there yet where they can perfectly replicate a human, but we're getting there. Or maybe and I'm an AI right now. And if so, um, AI overlords, I love you. Make sure I have a great life in the future. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm getting uh, duped but, right now. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I find it fascinating, honestly. And I think like anything else, it's a great tool. And to not use it to your advantage is almost like stifling yourself. But I also don't think that you should only use AI. Like, that's not really creating, you know? Uh, but I think it can be great, um, a helpful tool, like, if you don't have great grammar construction, like, or syntax, like, a great grasp on that. Like, maybe help your writing structure a little bit. It, it, you can use it to learn, you know? I think it is an interesting tool. Uh, but I don't think... It, I, I would be disappointed if people chose to use it to completely replace the human aspect of things. But I guess, like, for people who have, you know, no funding to put forth, I think it's also a really good tool for, you know, let's say somebody wants to write a script, but they don't have anyone to voice it and can't pay anyone and nobody's willing to do it for free. Like, cool, good for them. They can get their creation out into the world. So I see sort of like a positive and negative side to it. Unfortunately, I feel like. Most things in the real world, people like to view it as white or black, you know, good or evil, but generally it falls in a realistic gray area. <laughs> right, and I didn't want to seem like I was uh, entrapping you, because I know that in, I, I think it was like your most recent um, video, that you used AI art to like kind of create like those um, yeah. like collage kind of animation things or whatever. Um, but I mean, that like that, I used that as a tool, and then I, as a human editor, you know, edited it 
um, to make it a more cohesive vision, which is part of the fun, in my opinion. I just use it as a tool, you know? Um, and I think it's silly to not use a tool, like, if you're going to, like, you know, you're just limiting yourself. It would be like when people used to, you know, cut film and glue them together, and then something like Adobe Premiere came out, and they were like, no! Like, I'm not using that. It's getting the hand, you know, labor out of it. Like, do you get what I'm saying, sort of? Like, I think it can be used to progress um, the human creativity as long as you don't take all human aspect out of it. <laughs> right, right. And I, I don't want to, like, fixate too much on this whole AI thing because I've talked about it, like, several times. I had, like, oh, a streak. Okay. I've had a streak of interviews where I talked about it, and I think I've kind of made, like, like my, I, I guess to, like, kind of summarize my broader point of it is because I, I did, like, way back when I was doing, like, solo content, um, an episode where I talked about AI, but like the whole gimmick was that I used like one of those AI voice, like those early AI voice things to like, you know, I wrote up a script and basically had like the AI voice read it. Um, Welcome to Podcast Boston. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, but granted, this was way before like the chat GPT generative AI, like, you know, movement that we have now. Um, yeah, that's the, a scary impressive sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, but the larger point I was trying to make was um, that I think there is, like like you say, kind of like this collaborative space that can exist with, like, you know, human artists using AI. Um, and, I, you know, I don't want, although I don't want, like, human artists to be completely replaced. I don't think they will because I think there's always going to be, like, this appreciative value to, like, human-made art in some form or fashion. Right. Um. But, uh, and I, at the heels of recording this episode, like, I know we had, like, people, uh, like, that Corridor crew, I think, getting flack because they released, like, part two of, like, that Rock, Paper, Scissors AI animation thing. Um, but they're doing it, like, at the heels of, like, this, you know, the, the, screw the actors strike, the actors and writers strike. Um, Interesting. I'd have to look into that. I mean, I feel like, I know corridors. I mean, they've proven multiple times they're amazing at special effects. So, I mean, I think it's silly to say that like they haven't, you know, contributed to the human aspect. But I mean, I also get if it's on the heels of like a writer strike. <laughs> yeah. No, and um, I mean, I mean, my criticism would be more that it just looks bad. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. <laughs> But, uh, and then there was, like, a smaller, like, Scooby-Doo animation that came out that used, like, AI voices, but I think it was, like, for, um, like, the old Scooby-Doo actors, like, the ones that have tragically passed away, and, you know, uh, that's, like, garnering some attention. Um, right. But, yeah, I mean, like, like, like you said, because you were talking about, like, oh, what's better, like, using an AI voice or, like, not paying a voice actor, and that's, like, you're right, that gets into some weird territory, I think, ethically. Yeah, that's sort of where I, I get it. Like, if you are, you know, like, I mean, I was a broke college student and even a broke high schooler once. Like, if you know, that's your only option to create something, I say go for it, because, I mean, you're not going to have funds. Like, if that's your only creative outlet, like, I, I would not blame you, you know? Like, use the tools available to you to create. That's right. sort of where I'm coming from, you know? <laughs> right, or um, if, if you want to, like, full commit to, like, I guess the most ethical option would be to, like, just not use any, like, if you can't afford to use the voices, just don't use any voices and do, like, a silent animation. I don't know, it, it gets so weird. Yeah, um, moral ambiguity there, it becomes hard, you know? <laughs> Right, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, so I, I don't know, but in, in any case, I, I hope that... Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty positive that there will be a human fee, uh, like, a future for, like, human-made art, although I know, like, pop art and, like, you know, like, the commercial art is just going to be dominated by AI in the future. Like, there's no, I think, getting around that. Like you said, it's kind of like this bell that can't be unrung, so yeah. to speak. Um, but we'll see how that pans out. I hope I hope everything turns out well. Yeah, interesting. I'll, I'll, I'm curious to see where it'll go, and especially with the exponential growth of how fast it's getting more intelligent. <laughs> but, um, I guess to kind of, well, somewhat tangentially, eh, I said that wrong, wow. 
but somewhat related to that is, um, you know, as you may or may not know, this podcast is like mainly with a focus on like film, television, and, you know, other forms of like media. So I guess I'm curious for yourself. Um, well, I, I guess let me ask this. Are you a big like movie guy yourself? Yeah, I, I love movies. Um, I, I mean, it was, I took a couple film classes in college and uh, I was part of MSU Telecasters. So I was sort of like, the equivalent of SNL digital shorts. Um, I worked on that, like at MSU. It's called MSU Sideshow. Uh, so now people can go and stalk me and find old footage of me. But um, uh, yeah, I, I really like film um, and the you know everything that goes behind it, like getting right angles and lighting and everything. But I also just enjoy good movies, and I try to you know suspend my disbelief and enjoy it for the first time before I logistically go and tear it apart. <laughs> But um, with your music background, do you think you would ever have like if you were ever given the opportunity to like you know create like a like a like a film score or anything like that? Ah, uh, yeah, I would love to do that. I've done similar things, and while I was in college, for you know other short films that people made, and uh, also just class projects and such for short, you know, like tell a story with several images that invokes emotion, stuff like that. Um, and I would love to go and approach that again now, knowing the things that I do. <laughs> I feel like I could do a lot better of a job, and I think that'd be a really fun uh, opportunity. So I would also really, really love to do the score for a video game. I'm big into RPGs and stuff, and I think that would be really fun. <laughs> Any dream series you would want to work on? Oh, man. I mean... Jeez, uh, I think it would be really cool to work on Persona or, you know, Final Fantasy, even Kingdom Hearts. That'd be really fun to write music for any of those. <laughs> yeah, they, um, they, they do have really, I think, um, of that, like, especially Persona, I, I really do enjoy, even though, admittedly, I haven't played too many of, like, the, I really haven't played any of the games because, um, I just don't necessarily have the time for like JRPGs yeah, so yeah, you like, have like that. hundred hours. <laughs> like, do you have a hundred hours to invest into beating one game? <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, I, I've talked about this before on the show, but like, uh, I, I kind of have a weakness because um, I don't know if it's like I'm tone deaf or something, but like, I don't necessarily have as much of a music or an ear for music. Um. And uh, that's always been kind of like a weak point for me in analyzing films because, like, you know, the soundtrack is like a significant part of like a lot of movies. But yeah, um, I never have like the full, uh, you know, I always feel like I'm missing that context by not being able to like analyze it the way that like a lot of other people do. Um, so for yourself though, um, thinking of like all the movies that you have watched, is there like any like one mu like movie that's like has your favorite soundtrack or your favorite like soundscape? Uh yeah, I would recommend The Fountain. Um, wow, that's a great movie. It has Hugh Jackman in it, and it's I don't know how to explain it. I wouldn't say like an art film, but it definitely gives you that feeling, if you know what I'm saying, <laughs> of like, huh, it makes you think. Uh, but the soundscape and the score that was written for it is absolutely beautiful. And also, it's just a good movie uh, if you want to think about life and the universe in a different way for a while. And that, like, approach time is, you know, it, the movie's written in a way that approaches our concept of time, that it isn't necessarily a linear thing, like we live our everyday life. So it's just... It's a really interesting movie, and the way that the music is written and the whole soundscape is written for it is just beautiful and fantastic. So I really recommend uh, listening to the soundtrack for that movie. It's not my favorite movie of all time, but I mean, it is a really good movie, too. So check out that movie, I guess. <laughs> right. I, I was trying to remember The Fountain. Like, that one got, like, mixed reviews when it first came out. Like, I think right now I'm looking it up. It's, like, 53% uh, on, like, Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, uh, I can see why. Um, people wouldn't like it. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Was it a Christopher Nolan movie? I'm not sure. Uh, let me see here. Director? No, Darren Aronofsky. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, Darren Aronofsky. Yeah, it was really... I, I don't know. I, I thought it was interesting. I would say my favorite movie, though, if we're just going for movie recommendations, 
has got to be everything everywhere all at once that was really good out of recent movies that i've seen definitely the best one. Oh, i love that movie i'm so glad that it, Isn't it? i'm so glad it did well in the oscars yeah me too and it's not like a movie i would traditionally think to do well in the oscars you know yeah yeah no because um that was like kind of some people's i think like kind of criticism of that movie is that like oh it's good but it's like oscar good and like i i don't care i i, I enjoy the movie I, I i like when the oscars get weird with their nominations you know yeah. go yeah. off of uh, maybe laugh it made me think you know <laughs> yeah it's a good movie it's a good movie i think i think like a lot some of the backlash i think is like way too harsh against that film um, oh definitely and it was also coming off the back of like you know this whole trend of like uh, a trend that we're still kind of in of like multiverse movies, right? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. But I guess uh, so. So I guess for um. Yeah, like you you were talking about how you wanted to get to like video game composition and I know like um there's like special considerations that you have to take into account for like that type of music because it has to be like something that kind of like loops because you don't know how long a player is going to be listening for. They could be listening yeah. just for like a few seconds and sometimes you have to have like the integration like switching between different themes at certain times. Um That's yeah, it definitely needs to be loopable, and I think uh, everything, at least the way I would approach it now, would be everything be split up into, like, sections of song, like, by a certain amount of bars. Um, and then also keeping in mind the BPM and key of each of those bars, so I could easily, if it needs to switch to another one, keep that transition in mind when writing the other themes that surround it of what it could possibly transition to. Uh, I also know, like, just viewing from video games, because I enjoy playing them so much, uh, they tend to fade in as you traverse between areas and over like big overworld type games. So that'd be something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, I think having, you know, understanding music theory and relative keys and, you know, what type of keys and chord progressions evoke different types of emotion and things like that would just be a thing to keep in mind when approaching it. Um, but also I like, approaching music creatively too and just being like you know just throwing my heart into my music too I, I don't think like people sometimes get weird if you talk about the music theory of music it's like following certain rules doesn't make you less creative it just event, like it gives you a subset of tools to evoke motions more you know or like in a more efficient way and you don't always need to follow those rules it's just sort of helpful guidelines you know right like uh the example i would draw is that like one of my favorite like i guess more well it's not even really classical because i think it's like uh like modern or postmodern. um i, I yeah. get so mixed up with my like my artistic terms myself right but, like, that, that it's confusing because like the year that it came out like you know makes it romantic or classical i get what you're saying yeah, but for me, um, a movement that I really liked in music, uh, well, I, I like, you know, um, is minimalism. I like minimalism, like, in, like, art broadly, but I think in music, it it's led to, like, some interesting um, kind of uh, applications. Like, I think what you've seen with, like, Philip K. Glass and different, and different artists like that. Um, you know, I, I guess since you have studied music in more of a collegiate setting, um what what is your favorite what has been your favorite movement in music so far uh new metal no i'm kidding <laughs> uh, i do love new lincoln park and stuff though i just um i don't know that was the first thing that came to my head because i saw a fred durst limp biscuit meme earlier today but <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, it just made me laugh um man my favorite that's really difficult uh you don't have to be like artistic but like even like you know you know in like a pop art like a like you know pop culture sense like any type of movement like that i was just picking like an artistic one because you know I'm yeah pretentious. i feel like i really liked the early pop punk scene of like 2006 to like 12 uh just because of like the lyrics were generally relatable um like you know everybody's done this dumb stuff in their young years and you know and like it's 
ah, oh, like it gives you that ah oh, euphoria feeling of man, I remember those times and I used to do dumb stuff like that. But also, it just makes me sort of feel good when I listen to it. Um, but I also love really complicated things like progressive rock and metal. Like, I don't know, like Dream Theater, Rush, you know, uh, as we we came as leaders. Um, uh, it, sorry, Animals as leaders. I sort of spaced out there. Um, it's really hard for me to pick a favorite genre because I also love things like Daft Punk, or I even love, you know, classic, I wouldn't say classic rap, but I mean, I love things like Biggie Smalls, you know, I really enjoy different genres. Um, I was really into 21 Pilots' first album, too, The Vessels, because I thought that was a cool bridge of, like, emotional hip-hop. I don't even know what I would call them, you know, genre-wise. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so hard for me to say, like, a favorite genre or movement of music. Um, I, anything that I think creates a positive atmosphere and fan base, I really, really enjoy because it tends to bring people together. I, I, I can get behind that. Even if it's not my favorite to listen to, I like the positivity that it brings to the world. I'm generally going to support anything that like brings people closer together rather than divides by argument, you know? Right. No, I get you. Um, but... Uh... So I, I guess on the opposite side of that, are there any trends in particular that you hate now or in the past? Uh, um, uh, I don't say I hate it, but I got sort of sick of like 2014 pop where it was like catchy hook, like 808 drums, and then Pitbull feature rap. Like, that was like every song. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I mean, it was catchy, but I was like, I, I got over it pretty quick, you know? Uh, <laughs> um, nothing particularly I would say that I hate musically, because, I mean, I like seeing progression, and I like new things, uh, because it's new, and I like seeing people put their creativity into the world. Um... Lately, I've been on a big corpse kick. I don't know. His songs are just... He has a fun gimmick, you know? <laughs> he has a fun gimmick of, like, weeb stuff, sexy, low voice, and trap music. It's just fun to listen to. <laughs> um, I know this is kind of a... Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's really the case anymore because uh, the genre itself has, like, changed so much, but I know there was, like, kind of this big trend again i'm not sure if it's still ongoing of like hating country music so i guess um from your perspective like it or hate it mm, i mean there's stuff that i like within the genre it's not my go-to to listen to if i'm gonna put on music for self-enjoyment you know but i don't hate it that's for sure uh like i know this is like i mean i especially really enjoy um especially when i was getting into like my I want to be the best musician, so I'm going to study every genre phase and, like, all the classics. Like, of course, I love stuff like Johnny Cash, you know? Uh, it's just great. Um, I think, like, the stereotype radical of any genre is going to be annoying and not give it a very positive representation of it because, you know, people are like, oh, country, that's like the hilly-billy Alabama-type music, and not all of it's going to be like that, you know, but I think that's generally the negative stigma behind country. And I'm not going to enjoy that specific avenue of country myself either. But I mean, I think it's you're limiting yourself and just being sort of shallow if you are, you know, limiting a whole genre. And you're also limiting yourself to, for positive experiences. And I tend to enjoy liking things more than I like picking things apart. <laughs> you know, I don't really subscribe to the. I'm cooler because I don't like something. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> like, not a contrarian, like, right? Yeah, I'm not a contrarian. Like, if I can enjoy something, like, I'm not going to blame someone for liking stuff. Like, it's cool to like things. That's sort of where I come from. <laughs> um, well, I mean, for me, it's always tough to say because I, I do appreciate, like, the, the deeper analysis of things, even if it is to, like, pick it apart. I, I think I, I have a fun in that process in and of itself. Um, oh, yeah, me too. And I can get down into saying, like, this is what I personally prefer and look at it from an objective standpoint. But some people, I feel, 
and this is generally what I noticed from the hate of country music. They're like, I hate country because everyone hates country, or I've only heard this selected subgenre. You know, it's sort of like if people are like, I hate anime or I love anime, and then they only watch like the most popular shonen. It's like not a very accurate depiction of this whole big thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, I have a love hate relationship with anime that I'm still tackling with slowly. Um, but damn it, I have to ask. Are you a fan of anime? Oh gosh, uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, with the amount I've seen, I feel like I'd be lying if I said I'm not. I, I love anime, and the amount I've seen is staggering. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah, it, it confirms. But I mean, there's a lot that I'm like, why did I watch that? You know, also. <laughs> no, and and this isn't on you, but it's a running joke on this show that um. I'm apparently the Weibo Supremo, like, even though I'm not, like, I don't watch, I don't watch a lot of anime, right? But I just seem to be a vortex of everything, like, like, weeb related, you know? <laughs> I don't know, is it me? Godly. Maybe. I mean, I think it comes with the territory of having an internet podcast. Just Yeah, that's, it. yeah, that's yeah. fair. <laughs> I guess. Um, also, I mean, anime like, even in the early 2000s was much more, like, subculture. You'd get, like, bullied or made fun of, where now it's, even, like, stuff like superheroes and anime, it's, like, mainstream, you know? It's sort of cool to like anime. <laughs> right, and I, I would argue we're kind of, in many ways, we're in, like, a better place in terms of that media, despite, like, some issues. Like, I think we do have a problem with, like, an oversaturation. Oh, of, yeah. Of everything, really. That's true. I feel like now that the internet, I mean, that's a big part of the internet, right? Is everybody being able to put stuff out there and things progressing and technology to make it faster. I feel like even in the early 2000s, like I'd see anime and I'd be like, wow, that one's amazing. Or I'd be like, a lot of these are okay at best. But now I feel like every anime is just like 7 out of 10, you know? So it's like, there's no real bad anime or good anime. Like, like occasionally it's almost more fun for a horrible one to come along because at least it stands out. Or, like, if everything's just this level of good, then it, you know. <laughs> 7 out of 10's doing a lot of legwork there. <laughs> I'd say, like, <laughs> 5 true. out of 10. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. And maybe I'm just selective. Because I, if I don't like something, if it doesn't, if people are like, yeah, you need to get to episode 17 to watch it, I'm like, you know, I sort of like enjoying things from episode 1. So if I'm not, if I'm not enjoying it by, like, it's episode 3, I'd stop watching, you know? Nah, it, it's okay. I'm just being a hater, to be honest. Um, <laughs> there's fair. a lot of like current trends in anime. I'm I'm not like the biggest fan of right now. The, uh, that's one I don't like. It's like you need to get to episode 19, and then that twist will make you be like, "Oh, I love it, man!" Oh, that's insane. I'm sorry. Like, if, an epi- if a show doesn't pick me up by like episode three, I'm outy. Yeah, same. That's that's where I'm at. <laughs> I have other things to do with my life. Yeah, exactly. Um. But I guess, uh, I guess as you, mm, no, that might be too abstract of a question to ask. Uh, I'm trying to think like for yourself, like, do you think you'll ever like grow bored of doing like electronica music, I guess in a way, because I know like, you know, as artists like age and stuff like that they approach like different genres like oh maybe i'm like too young to be in this scene or that scene or like whatever uh i mean i don't think i'll grow bored of it but i think my music is a reflection of who i am as a person uh and i think if i'm the same person i am right now in two years that's sad because i'm stagnant and haven't been doing any self-growth and change uh the fact that if i haven't grown from two years of experiences that's just a reflection of me as a person. So I don't think it's necessarily I'll become bored with it, but I mean, I expect to keep growing with the different experiences and life that I live, you know? So I'm sure that the music I'm making two years from now might not necessarily reflect on me in the same way because I won't be the same person, you know? <laughs> no, that's very that, that's a very respectable answer. Um, I guess, well, this is always kind of an interesting trend that I've talked with a few other, like, musical artists with, and I guess uh, I should get your opinion on it, too, is that, you know, um, I don't know how much of a generational gap exists between us. Like, I imagine I'm probably older than you, but, um, like, 
like I, I remember like kind of a bit a uh, time before like YouTube and like this explosion of like content in general where a lot of music was like very uh kind of regionally located like you had you know the famous like east coast west coast split oh yeah you had the nashville like, like country e scene sorry god i said it was either biggie or tupac you know yeah i get it uh, <laughs> right. um but with advent of youtube that, like none of that like really exists anymore because you know like music is so widely distributed that like everyone's like listening to like the same artists across like you know like different states or even like different countries yeah right I and i always wonder if something was kind of lost with that you know um i feel like definitely regionality i think is more lost in it in a way but it also like that's sort of the joke i was making earlier about like everything com becoming like a conglomerate mess of like everyone's gonna have face tattoos rap and play guitar and ride horses like <laughs> it's just the thing is like now that everything's out there everywhere and so easily accessible like i feel like you're not region locked by music and culturally which i guess i don't know um i don't know if that's a benefit or a negative to society because that's more of a philosophy question right but i think it is cool that everybody has access to whatever community that they feel part of and resonate with more. And it's not like you feel stuck. So I think that part of it's at least positive. And I generally try to focus on the positive, but I also understand like respecting your culture and upbringing is like a big part of, you know, past and history. So I don't know, take it or leave it, you know, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I do enjoy personally being able to, Fine, yeah, I think I'm also kind of in a similar grounds where there's like positives and negatives of it. Although again, like with the future potential advent of like AI art, I think those problems are really gonna be like compounded. Yeah. Um, and I can't stress again support the Screen Actors Guild strike for the love of God. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, definitely. I I'm one hundred percent on board with that. Uh, I mean writers should be paid what they deserve to be paid. <laughs> absolutely um well we are approaching the um hour mark here and I, I know you said that you had you know like plenty of time i guess i want to like kind of end on this question i guess more so for your own audience you talked briefly yeah. about like your future projects but uh, and granted i don't know how far ahead you think of these things but can you give us like a broad timetable of like your future releases yeah so um, as soon as I hit YouTube partner, I'm going to release this Cosmic Heartbeat album, which is this full electronic one. Uh, and I'm going to release that for free, the whole thing on YouTube. Um, and I'm going to put it on Spotify and Apple Music and all those other things. I just want to be able to at least make some YouTube ad revenue money off of it. So, you know, watch those uh, playlists and things. But yeah, this full studio album for Cosmic Harpy. I also have fully recorded an instrumental, like, sonic rock album. I don't know what to call it. It's like, almost like the music you'd hear in the background of Final Fantasy. Um, that type of genre, so I don't know what you want to call that. J-rock? <laughs> uh, but uh, that I called The Hero's Journey, which was I wrote during a very introspective part of myself. Um, after... Uh, uh, I went through a breakup with a fiance and uh, decided to quit drinking alcohol um, and, you know, really took a look at myself. So it's like my personal hero's journey for growth. And now I'm working on Laundry Day and that sort of has more humorous lyrics. So that one will be further down the line. Uh, but that one is going to be fun because I'm approaching the writing style in sort of a humorous way. Uh, and every character in it will be sort of a caricature of myself and i'm bringing friends in on it just for fun even though i'm like writing a lot of the music myself in the background um yeah it's just you know uh so expect laundry day further down the road uh and i'm gonna approach this cosmic heartbeat's gonna be released soon i'm hoping it'll be by you know mid late october i don't have a finalized date on that yet um and you know then Whenever that's out, uh, one month after Cosmic Heartbeat releases, I will release The Hero's Journey as well. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, so your fiancé. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. 
Oh, um, I'm at peace with it. Uh, thank you, though. I appreciate it. That was uh, three years ago now. Um, then I have happily moved on and am in a much healthier, happy relationship. And we both found each other after doing self-growth and therapy on ourselves. So we, you know, have a much healthier form of communication, you know? <laughs> well, rock on. Yeah, I hope it, I hope it works out for you. Um, I, I guess... You. Uh, well, so you yeah, said, I'm uh, 29 in November, by the way. So I don't know if that helps your age gap at all. <laughs> oh, um, no, I'm like I'm turning 30 this year. So yeah, I guess we don't have that different of an age gap. Um, but you said like one of your goals is to reach a YouTube partner. Um, how close? How close are you to that? Uh, right now, I would say. Well, I'm about at 1.5 thousand watch hours as we speak. I've already hit the subscriber goal, but I need to hit 4,000 watch hours. Luckily, it has been steadily growing, so anything people can do to help to share my, you know, lo-fi mixes, since that brings in the most watch time, be like, oh, hey, I hear you like listening to lo-fi in the background, or I hear you like relaxing or sleep meditation music. Let them throw on my playlist of lo-fi music, which I have on my channel that's just specifically the lo-fi ones. That would help me a lot, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> Well, I, I will definitely do that with this uh, uh, episode here, try and link to your content if I can, but um, we are a little past the hour mark. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you want to support the show, you can do so in a number of different ways. Uh, if you want to do monthly donations, as always, the Patreon is still available. You have three different tiers. I think the two higher tiers give you exclusive merch. All the tiers give you uh, your name read in the credits section here, but I don't have any patrons, so the section's blank. Uh, if you want to do a one-time donation, because I understand, like, you know, not everyone has the money for the monthly thing, um, but for one-time donations, I recommend my Ko-Fi account. You can also do monthly there, but again, for, like, the perks and everything, I would recommend Patreon. All this is linked on my link tree, which is in my Twitter bio, or, I'm sorry, X bio. <laughs> Stupid Elon. Um, <laughs> uh, on my ex profile, uh, at Podcasting Pasta. Again, that's at Podcasting Pasta. All one word. Uh, P's are capitalized. I'm not sure if it matters for X. Um, uh, I also have a merch store through that link tree. So you get really cool merch done by the great um, Nocturnal Essence, a good friend of the channel. Uh, Brandon, thank you so much for. Um, joining us today if you want to go ahead and shout out where people can find you i know you have your youtube i think you also have like a yeah. soundcloud uh yeah i actually have a youtube right now um my spotify will be out later but right now you can find me at youtube and brandon camp music uh b-r-a-n-d-o-n-k-a-m-p and then music i also now have a discord uh that you can check out on that youtube there's a link to it there and i now have a merch store as well so go check out synthetic muse on etsy also, um, if you want to, I can send you a song that is an original that hasn't been released yet that could play right after this, if you would like. <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah, we'll talk about that after the recording. But yeah, again, thank you so much for everyone for joining us um, and take care. Bye. Yeah, have a great one. Thanks for having me.